Welcome to Fintech Impact. This podcast is an exploration of the financial technology world, interviewing different fintech entrepreneurs about what they do, their story, and what their impact is on consumers, incumbents, and the industry as a whole. Here's your host, award-winning financial planner, university lecturer, and writer, Jason Pereira. Hello, and welcome to the Fintech Impact Podcast. I'm your host, Jason Pereira. And thank you for joining me for this inaugural episode. I hope you enjoy it. My first guest, I have Dave Nugent, CIO and co-founder of Wealthsimple. Wealthsimple is Canada's largest robo-advisor, a digital platform for delivering investment solutions to clients. In addition to that, they also have an advisor platform that allows us to utilize that same technology and leverage it with our clients in order to make for better client experiences. So with that, here's Dave. Dave, thanks for coming in. Thanks for having me. Good to have you in. And thank you for helping me launch this thing. No problem. Yeah. So, Dave Nugent, CIO of Wealthsimple. Tell us about Wealthsimple. Yeah, Wealthsimple is um, is a digital investment manager, otherwise known as a robo. We launched the business in the fall of 2014. Uh, we now serve about uh, 60,000 clients, about $2 million of assets. We've got offices now in, in Canada, in the U.S., and the U.K., and Power Financial is kind of our main backer. We raised about $165 million of, of capital from them. Our client base is a little bit unique for the industry. We really focus in on kind of the millennial investor on our direct-to-consumer business. And then we launched a, a B2B offering, working with traditional advisors to kind of power their business, which launched about a year and a half ago. And it's probably the business that's growing, uh, well, they're both growing Quite quickly, but it's the most unique side when you think of robo advisor. And historically, you've looked at the media has always portrayed robo versus human, and you've got the cyborg picture in the print. And I think what we tried to show is that good advisors who want to do holistic planning don't want to spend their time doing paperwork. They want the transparency. They want the efficiencies. And we're basically giving it to them. Well, to be fair, Wealthfront kind of antagonized everybody on that front, didn't they? <laughs> yeah, I mean, you know, it's uh, the Canadian model has been different. I mean, yeah. when the Canadian model got up and running, the big difference between the two models was that we were we had to call every single client with a phone call. Where in the U.S., uh, none of that actually happens. How many phone calls did you do in the first year? Oh God, thousands! It was uh, fourteen hours a day doing uh, suitability calls. We've now got an exemption around that, but certainly that was kind of the genesis of offering our services to regular advisors to help them kind of scale their businesses because their legacy systems that they currently work off of are inadequate going forward. I love how you dropped $165 million in funding like it was pocket change. That's, uh, that's amazing. <laughs> <laughs> and congratulations on the last round. You just got Thank another you. 50-some odds, so that's um, that's burning a hole in your pocket. <laughs> so uh, before we get back to the company, tell me about your, your personal journey and what led you to help start this company. Yeah, I was a RBC Dominion Securities advisor. I've been there kind of as a summer student, then worked my way into being an advisor. And I think the big thing for me was, you know, I was starting out in the business at 22, asking business owners for their entire life savings. And uh, actually realized quite early that my target ended up being divorced and widowed women, which was a totally different niche than what the average advisor goes after. But there was still a missing void when it came to working with my peers and friends. And so met Mike when he had just come back from California. Uh, And he kind of told me about the idea and and what it was all about. And and I figured I could kind of bridge the gap of kind of the advice side that I'd been kind of focused in on with the technology side, which would be kind of the way in which I'd be able to help people like myself manage their money. You guys got matched up by Som Safe, was it? Correct. Yeah. So Som being a well-known Toronto investor and uh, entrepreneur in his own right. Good. So a couple of things. First of all, you guys, the name simple is absolutely perfect because the way you guys do everything is very, very simplistic. At yeah. least, and I, I mean that as a compliment, not as a, a negative thing, because I've never gotten feedback on the use of your technology that says, oh my God, this is terrible. Yeah. <laughs> like, yeah. It's always like, oh, this is really, really easy to use. Why is your other system not like this? Yeah. <laughs> I think like for us, we've focused in on the client experience. And, you know, if you look at the way our team is composed, we've got a lot of people that come from technology and design. 
but not so many from the financial world. And and so when they look at a problem, they're looking at it from a, a usability standpoint and very different approach than what historically has been used, certainly in financial services. Yeah, we get lost in the complexity of it all and think terms like alpha are the things that clients want to hear out of our mouths. Exactly. Right? So, and the interesting thing is too, you're targeting specifically a demographic that's been largely avoided in general because people think it's not profitable, right? Yeah. You're after millennials. Yeah, I mean, you know, millennials in our minds are fantastic clients because they're just at the beginning of their careers. They've got a whole lifetime of earnings ahead of them. They've got a bunch of life stages they're going to go through, whether it be buying a house, getting married, having kids, inheritance. There's a lot of opportunity there for planning. But unfortunately, you know, day one, they don't have the assets yet for to get the interest of advisors. On the flip side, there are advisors that would want to help them if they had the capacity or the ability to be there. And so there has been a disconnect up until this point. And so in our direct business, we've been kind of supporting the end client who doesn't want to go meet an advisor in person. On the advisor side of the business, it's how do you help those advisors service more of those clients in an efficient way while still allowing them to do the planning, the insurance, the tax, whatever it happens to be. It's funny because you know you're you're hitting a word over and over again that I don't want people to avoid, which is the advisor's support side. Yeah. And one of the reasons why I started this podcast altogether was because of the sheer panic and fear yeah. that everyone has of companies like you. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> like it's 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 shocking. Like I mean, we've shared stories about this in the past, but you're out there saying, "Hey, work with us." Like if you think what we're doing is dangerous to you, why are you not just working in collaboration with us? Yeah. And we'll make your life easy. So listen, I, I think the easy answer is I always said we will empower the good advisor to do more business and mm-hmm. we'll expose the bad advisor and they're going to be in trouble. Absolutely. And I think most advisors out there that show their value to clients on a continuous basis would agree that their biggest challenge to growing their business today is not having enough time in the day. The challenge that they're facing is not that they're just constantly in client meetings. It's they're constantly dealing with, on top of the meetings, the operational and compliance burden that is put upon them by both their dealership and yeah. regulation. A document comes back, it's you know 40 pages long, and oops, you missed the initial on page 13. Yeah. And we go back to the client with that. Exactly. I, I'm so frustrated. I remember I shared with you the story. The first time I, before we even met, the first time I even got exposure to your app, I said, you know what? Like, let me just try this out. And I downloaded it on the app store. And I onboarded, did all the money laundering uh, stuff and essentially had the money, had my account funded, at least the account and money on the way within yeah. four minutes. Yeah. And immediately I was just thoroughly impressed. Any advisor who hasn't used it should really check it out because to me it's, it's the way to go. Well, and the crazy thing is we don't have a compliance person that oversees the account opening. Nor should you. You systemized it. Yeah. <laughs> so it only it only flags those clients for human review when it's actually necessary. Otherwise, it goes right through. Yeah. And so if you think about where the industry has is going, it's an increase in human support on the compliance, the administration, and ops side. Yep. Therefore, it's forcing advisors to do more revenue to get paid the same amount on their grids yeah. because that's where the costs are coming from. And so if you can actually streamline all of that out of it, it makes it better for the dealer. Because de- dealers don't want to be hiring all these people either. No, I, I've, been, I've joked for years that the only growth area in our business has been in the compliance side. And, it, and you know, here's the thing: it's I think it's it's the old school business's way of looking at a newer problem. Sadly, the newer problem is increased regulation, which yeah. frankly is overdue. Yeah. But the problem is, is that they always used to throw bodies at it. Yeah. And those bodies used to be lower cost. Yeah. Now they're becoming higher cost, yeah. and the burden is just increasing exponentially, and the systems aren't there to deal with it. For sure. So like I said, I was thoroughly impressed the first time I used it. And then about two minutes later, I was thoroughly angry because I thought about what my clients and I had to go through on board. <laughs> and I was just like, why in God's name? Like, I've seen the light now. Let, let's move forward with this. So, yeah. so the day that I'll be able to use you wholesale for some like is a day I look forward to. In general, how's the reaction with the advisor community been Like in, in your experience, the ones you're dealing with or, or the hate mail you get? <laughs> you know, like I guess the honest answer is there's both. Yeah. I think if everyone felt the same way, we wouldn't be doing our job. So we're working with predominantly advisors that focus in on financial planning and they're really really getting this in the kind of mfda world right now there's so much talk about roll-up strategies and buyouts happening and whatnot Mm -hmm. but the average advisor takes them six to eight months to onboard the book it's painful at best and so 
we've been able to help streamline all of that. And so advisors that have decided to embrace it have realized that them filling out paperwork is not the reason why advisors are getting paid by clients. Yep. Clients are paying advisors because they see the value in the planning and the holistic advice that they're getting and the handholding. And the old school advisor who thinks that they should get paid because they're filling out paperwork, I mean, again, those are the advisors that we are that should see this as as a challenge. Well, they they should forward. get paid. Unfortunately, that pays an average salary of like thirty to fifty thousand dollars. <laughs> it is not one. It's not a salary they want. Correct. Right. So again, I, I agree with that. So you're unique in one respect. I don't think I've ever seen the robo advisor that operates in multiple countries. And you know, even when I was in the U.S. for conferences there, and people were looking for solutions for Canadian advisors, I was like, Hey, if you're familiar with the robo advisor like Betterment you've been using. Take a look at these guys because you can hold assets on both sides of the border. Yeah. So how's that experience been moving outside of Canada? I mean, certainly each country has their challenges and their pros. I mean, the regulatory environment in all three countries is vastly different. Mm -hmm. I would say that the UK certainly has been at the forefront of, of regulatory change. You haven't gone to Australia yet. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we haven't been to Australia. The U.S. has certainly been, uh, you know, around the actual requirements for suitability calls of clients. I mean, they go on on kind of one end of the spectrum, but I think it's helped us get better everywhere because we've been able to kind of see the good from different places, and and they they've all got their kind of pros and cons. The U.S. is just so much larger. You don't fully appreciate it until you're actually in it. All the statistic I heard was once that the uh, something along the lines of the entire Canadian investment industry wrapped up is not even the investment industry in California. Yeah, yeah. So it's it's, it's crazy the size. Yeah. And certainly, there's a lot more competition in the U.S. than than there is here. You know, in Canada, in terms of the amount of players, I would say that we took the kind of very human approach that we had in Canada and applied it in the U.S. and it's, it's resonating certainly with the same kind of demographic. Canadians living in the U.S. has certainly been a, a huge plus for us. Yeah, it's been a huge help to me. I mean, I'm able to yeah. put people on and with one portal with assets on both sides of the border. Yes. It's fantastic. Yeah. I mean, you know, usually you get a, a dealer that sees a, an, an RSP account while in the U.S. and it's kind of like, what do I do with this? Mm -hmm. And vice versa. Yep. So it certainly has been a, I wouldn't say an easy win, but certainly a, a huge leg up for us to be able to support both sides. It's a and niche. it's been the advisors that have actually been using and taking advantage of that more so. So no plans for Australia? No plans for Australia. <laughs> we, we've got our, uh, we're tied right now with the three countries and getting enough. them up and running. Fair enough. Speaking of those frustrations, what, what's holding you guys back? Like, what do you guys need to move forward? I think for us, there's always going to be this challenge of cost of acquisition. You know, mm -hmm. how do you continuously acquire clients at a reasonable price point and understanding what the value you're going to get from there is? And given the fact that our client base is relatively young, there's a whole bunch of things that could go into that calculation over time. And so building the brand uh, continues to be a main focus of ours and then increasing kind of the, the wallet share, if you will, you know, of the clients that we do have and making sure that, you know, yes, we're a digital platform where you may or may not know someone at the company on the advisor side, we still can be a trusted fiduciary to manage someone's entire kind of wallet. Now, one thing that makes you unique, at least in Canada, and I don't think I've seen this anywhere else, yeah. you guys own the full stack, but you own your own custodian. Yes. Which I don't, is there even a US player who owns their own custodian? No. No. So talk to me about how that's an advantage and what you've done on the custody side. You know, when we first got started, you know, we were looking for custodial partners. There was only one that would even let us do e-signatures. That was four years ago. You're starting to see a lot of them offer that as table stakes now. To a certain extent. It's Sadly, still, mine doesn't, it's but still, go on. <laughs> it's still not there yet. Mm -hmm. But we, we went with them and they served their purpose. But what we realized was that if we really wanted to change the industry, you know, our minimum account size is a dollar. You can't run an account efficiently at a dollar if you're paying overhead to a third party. The way that you do identity verification, the way you do AML, the way you do your reporting, all of that's your back office. And those are typically the pain points advisors face when there's client concerns or questions or complaints. And so, you know, there was obviously an economic benefit for us to own the full stack ourselves. But more importantly, there's a client experience advantage that we had. And we felt as if in order for us to compete and drive the volume and scale that we aspired to, we needed to control the full stack. So we were fortunate enough that we acquired our own IROC dealer called Canadian Share Owner back in 2015, just after the first 
capital raise the first Series A from Power. And basically been rebuilding that ever since to be a lot more dynamic. And that's why you saw when you signed up, you were able to get everything done in four minutes. It's because painful, we've, painful we've, we've, we've yeah. reconfigured <laughs> the back the back end part. Yeah, excellent. And that relationship with Power has been an incredible one for you. You want to speak to that at all? It has, yeah. I mean, Paul Demery the third is kind of the quarterback from the Power side. And he's been kind of tasked with coming up with kind of a fintech group of companies to that they wanted to invest in that kind of helps push the agenda along faster for power in terms of innovation, I guess, in general. And they realized quite early on, which I think makes them quite unique, was that they felt as if they couldn't do this stuff in-house. And so instead... Thank God they realized that. (laughs) Instead of them trying to kind of bring in their own people and build it themselves, they said, you know what, let's invest in, in a bunch of kind of fintech startups across the landscape. And they've subsequently created kind of a VC arm called Portage, uh, run by Adam Fales. He's the former founder of Horizon ETFs. So they've been fantastic partners for us. They've been able to obviously provide the financial resources, but more importantly, they've been operators of businesses for a number of years. So they've been really helpful, kind of helping us think through the various parts of the businesses. It never ceases to amaze me how a company that large can fly under the radar for so long. Yeah. That's insane. Yeah. I mean, and then, and yeah, they, how many acquisitions have they made on Portage now? I mean, it's got to be over a dozen. It's a good question. I think, yeah, 10 to 12, let's say. Yeah. Everything from wealth to insurance to banking to credit cards. Yeah, they're all over the map. I, uh, it's smart. I like to call it a game of very obvious chess. It's like, we, we can't own a bank, so let's just own everything a bank does. Yeah. <laughs> and pretty much. Yeah, and have have focused teams working on those, solving those challenges yeah. and problems. Exactly. And you're getting more, that way you're not distracted by one issue, right? You're building out, everybody's working on building the best widget for that one specific purpose. Exactly. Fantastic. Yeah. We need more of that in this country. So with that, you guys have also built out a number of interesting kind of custom solutions as well. I mean, you guys launched the first halal portfolio in yeah. North America or was it the world? Yeah. 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 You know, our clients, the average age is 31. The millennial investor is a very different investor, I think, than ever before. We did our first foray into socially responsible investing with just a broad ETF portfolio. Mm-hmm. And the feedback was, this is a great start, but we expect and we want more. We want to focus in on very specific thematic portfolios and we don't want to pay an arm and a leg for them the way that the industry has historically done it. And mm-hmm. so the Halal portfolio was kind of our first foray into direct indexing. So there isn't obviously a Sharia compliant portfolio that really exists here in Canada. There are in the U- Europe. And so we partnered with MSCI. They've got a really strong kind of academic Sharia committee. And we built an index that we go by 50 equal weight names across North America. We'll look to continue to expand the direct indexing model and other kind of thematic portfolios. What are the themes that you are you working on? Can you not talk about that? Can't talk about it at this point, uh, but you'll see it most likely come out in April. Fantastic. Now, on the SRI side, now a large portion of what you're opening, just because you're asking the question, yep. is going towards SRI. Yeah. So what, what percentage of accounts would you say are you on there? In the U.S., it's about 50 cents on the dollar really? allocated to socially responsible investing. Wow. You don't pay any more for it than you do the yeah. regular portfolio. So people are, are kind of gravitating towards. And obviously, the focus on technology stocks in that type of portfolio hasn't it's hurt no, absolutely. by any means. But behaviorally, it's also been really interesting because you don't see the same type of reaction in a downturn when someone has a, a purpose that goes beyond just performance and returns. They're looking at at it as kind of they want to invest in these types of companies. And it's interesting because we have a background in SRI in this office here. Yeah. And, and you know, one of the things that I always find astonishing is the growth in that industry is enormous. Yes. Yeah, it's all been institutional. Like yeah. a retail advisor just has their head in the sand over it. And you guys have at least asked the question, yeah. which studies show that if you ask the question, you're more likely to land a business. Yeah. So the fact that you've done that is brilliant. The fact that you have 50 cents in a dollar in the U.S. going in is staggering to me. The other thing, too, is that one of the other studies that came out, too, that I remember seeing was that they actually tend to have a slightly better performance advantage simply because, again, people are less likely to let greed be the motivating factor on the sure. downturn, right? They care about the cause yeah. and therefore they're more willing to stomach it. And as we know from Dalbar studies, timing in the market is time in the market is more important than timing it. For sure. So you mentioned direct indexing there. Yeah. So have you guys, have you been doing tax loss harvesting with direct indexing yet? Or is that basically something on the uh, radar? We haven't done it as of yet. We've kind of kept it relatively simple. 
yeah. uh, thus far. <laughs> That's your model, man. But yeah, we will look to, we've been kind of doing some work on how do we do tax loss harvesting while kind of maintaining the integrity of the tracking error. So when we kind of feel comfortable with it, we'll, we'll launch that as well. So for anyone unfamiliar with that concept, essentially, we all know what tax loss harvesting is, but to automate that process throughout the year is valuable. But when you're doing it through direct indexing, which is holding each individual security, the number of opportunities for tax loss harvesting just grows dramatically. And I think that that is, I'm very curious to see what the data that comes out of yeah. the wealth fronts of the world are already doing that in the next yeah. couple of years is going to look like because yeah. that could be a big game changer there. For now, sure. Let's go back to this $1 thing. So I know you can open an account with $1. Tell me, so talk to me about how you make, make that happen. When we got started, the biggest reaction clients always have when, when you ask them why they don't invest, they say they don't have enough money. And we wanted to kind of democratize the way in which anyone invests and take all excuses out of the equation. So you the only way job there. the only way we could do that <laughs> was to drop it to a dollar. You know, share owner when we bought them had a unique ability that they had already had built out fractional ownership in the books and records in the back end. So we buy a whole share of a security, but we'll go to the fourth decimal place in terms of allocation. So we'll always have some fraction of the shares on our books that we'll use to cross between the various accounts. But that allows us to basically buy a, a full portfolio down to a dollar. So when we've talked to on the advisor side, we work with active managers that manage money for the, the end advisor. And they're used to dealing in million dollar account minimums. So they kind of chuckle. But, you know, you're getting these active managers who historically have only dealt with a very specific target group now be able to offer their services to virtually anyone. Yeah, but I mean, you know, think about why that was. It was resource constraints, right? Yeah. You can't market to everybody. Your your biggest bank for your buck is on larger ones. Yep. And there was a cost of it. I mean, like yep. it was, you know, we're all paying, you know, the registration fees like $128 per RSP and all that. Yep. You have to change the model to make it work. Yeah, and all those nickel and dime fees. I mean, yeah. I laugh when people talk about their custodian pricing because everyone's different. There's no commonality. No. And the nickel and dime fees are never talked about. And so, you know, the way that we kind of go to the market is say, we want to have simple pricing. To the client, they need to know exactly what they're paying up front. But if you're talking to an advisor and they want to run their business properly, if they don't exactly know what they're paying for, how do they run their business properly, right? As someone who swallows those fees for clients, I feel that pain. Yeah. 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 Well, we were, we were swallowing those fees when we first started. And, and going like, what is going on? And we were kind of <laughs> saying like, this is, this is crazy. Why is there this fee? So anyways, we, we got rid of all of them. But more often than not, it was solely based on the fact that the custodian was running things in an archaic way. And, you know, their yeah. profit centers were what they were because they were basically paying people to push paper as opposed yeah. to, I think you told me something to the effect of like 85% of your processes or something like that. Yeah. And you, yeah. Are backed up or automated. That's yeah. incredible. So, yeah. So, I mean, you guys are collecting a lot of data on people with this sort of stuff. Yeah. Uh, any, any thought towards what you're going to do in terms of like behavioral nudging in the future or any kind of... Uh, kind of way to basically make people behave a little bit better? Yeah, you know, we've started down that path. We created what we call a card system within the application that will allow anyone to basically put on either a message or a blog post or a video or whatever it happens to be targeting at certain people. So we've started to do it for clients who have a negative rate of return for their first 30 days. Mm -hmm. So if they sign up, a month ago, and we went through the downturn that we went to, the brief downturn that we went to. That, that huge correction the last two weeks. Yeah, yeah. but in the, in the moment, yeah. it felt terrible for yeah. clients. And so those particular clients got a message, got some kind of color put around it for mm -hmm. them. And what we ended up seeing was, you know, a really great response from clients on on what happened. So we'd like to kind of take that to the next level and continue to kind of expand on that. Certainly, when you look at a financial plan and you're off track on a financial plan, today it's really hard for the advisor to kind of be on top of all that stuff if they've got a huge client base. Mm -hmm. Wouldn't it be great if it nudged the advisor or not, and nudged the client to say, you guys should probably talk? <laughs> How do you get back on track? He's opened his account, his, uh, his app every five minutes for the last three hours you yeah. need to call <laughs> yeah well, our app only updates once a day so when people do log in multiple times a day it's kind of a sign that that something should probably be uh communicated to the client that's hilarious <laughs> now you mentioned something that about a behavioral cue you programmed in on a previous correction i think about yeah. how you didn't send out this massive email blast saying what's wrong yeah you targeted it like how that yeah. work? 
Yeah, so we have all the data on on you know what are the returns of those clients, and it's just writing a query to basically put in that particular client experience, a certain content piece that we had written, kind of explaining what was happening, why it wasn't a big deal, and what they should do about it, which was do nothing. And uh, you know, if you're up a bunch of money, you probably don't want to see that message. Or if you haven't even logged in, what's the point of kind of alerting someone to something that maybe wasn't an issue? So making it a little bit more kind of intelligent with the way in which communications delivered and disseminated, we felt it to be quite important. And certainly you could see how that could help an advisor run their business as well. Speaking of different communication, like your marketing has been very non-traditional. Yes. And, and, right, and very, very well done. Yeah. Can you speak to that? Yeah. Uh, well, the first thing we did was we hired a phenomenal marketing brand leadership team, and none of them come from the financial services industry. I'm noticing a theme here. Right? That <laughs> success is meant not that it means that you don't hire finance people. It's, it's hilarious. Well, you do. You, don't <laughs> just, you just don't need to hire as many of them. No. So our team, the head of our content comes from GQ magazine and the two creative uh, leads come from Wyden Kennedy where they did the kind of Levi's early Apple commercials. Mm. So they've got a very different take. Our content is obviously quite different. What we actually do a lot of is we talk about financial planning, but we never call it that. We turn in life. Yeah, it's life stage yeah. things. And, and what we've tried to do is we've tried to get inside the most inner thoughts of a client that they probably talk at a, with at a cocktail party, but then they never really kind of go past that. So kind of bringing that to life and talking openly and honestly about it has really resonated with clients. Our Money Diary series where we focus in on kind of interesting people and celebrities has been a, just a massive hit where we spend 500 to 1,000 words talking about some interesting person or celebrity and their kind of either rise to fame mm -hmm. and how money has affected them, positively or negatively. And also the flip side of that, of people kind of going down and, and how that's affected them. Yeah, the Anthony and, Bourdain was an interesting one. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, the Bourdain one was a good one. Uh, the Margaret Atwood one that we just did has mm -hmm. been kind of a huge... Has been our biggest one yet in terms of response. Really? Because she was the one who created the Handmaid's Tale. Oh, I was going to say it's totally based off the. Of <laughs> but she sold the rights to it before it became a TV show, so she didn't actually, or she, she hasn't not, profited from it. She hasn't oh, made any money. So that's what, they, that's what part of what the article is about. <laughs> Holding on to intellectual property. Yeah, but I mean, it's not just me saying this. I mean. I, personal response people I know I've had friends tell me that yeah they're, they're spouses who didn't care about any of this stuff or just suddenly turning them after watching your commercials and saying you know maybe we should really start talking about saving more yeah. <laughs> like little, little nudges like that that it works so well because you're not you're, you're talking to them and I often say that one of the biggest things advisors do wrong in this industry is talk over clients yeah. you want to seem smart you want to seem sophisticated you want to make this complicated stuff seem like you're on top of it yeah. and meanwhile all you're doing is isolate you're alienating them. they yeah. look at you blankly it's not a good thing We've tried to, ironically, for a digital technology play, yeah. we've tried to humanize financial services. Wasn't that one of your taglines on a billboard, investing yeah. for humans? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Investing for humans, but not using the face-to-face -face meeting as yeah. being the, the kind of grab. And that's kind of what's been resonating with clients. But that being said, you've done a wonderful job of reducing friction, right? Like, I mean, yeah. it's, yeah, you don't have the face-to-face, but my goodness, four minutes to get in there yeah. and, and accurate reporting, it's fantastic. The, you know, you guys have won some awards for what you've done in terms of the marketing side. Yeah. Right? So back to back Webby award winners, back to back Webby's. Yes. And tell everybody what that is for those who don't know. I didn't know either when we first started. When I, we first I heard won. of it a couple of times. <laughs> I, got, I got buddies in marketing, right? So. Yeah. So the Webby awards is basically kind of like the Oscars of the internet. So we won back to back awards for best financial services website globally with two different websites. You know, I think two uh, different websites back to back. Wow. Yeah, we kind of, you know, everyone says, why'd you rip it down? You know, most firms would say, put a stamp on that and never touch it. You know, we learned a lot in the year from how clients interacted with us. We felt as if we could do it better. So, you know, we redid it and, and won it for the second time. It was funny because the Webby's is you, you get to give like a like a four word acceptance speech. And of ours, course, it's marketing. It's all sound bites. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> ours was Trudeau. What was ours? Trudeau, Poutine. Canada, Poutine, Canada A, something like that. Didn't go so well. It came <laughs> off better when, when Mike said it. And then Kim Kardashian did hers right after, and it was nude selfies for life. Uh, so no one remembers yours. No one remembers Mike's acceptance speech. I don't even but, want to know uh, what Kim Kardashian went for. <laughs> 
I actually don't know what she won for either, but it was cool to be <laughs> in the same company. Spent money for either. <laughs> so, uh, in terms of the future, what you want to build out? Like you're, you guys are, you guys are creating it. So, like what, what else? What do you guys? What, what are the big burning issues for you that you want to create as soon as possible? You know, I think up until this point, we focused it on investment management in terms of product offering. Yes, we we talk from a brand perspective, and we have advisors. Uh, human advisors that can talk to planning, but we'd like to start to offer more products. I don't think that investment management is the only financial services product that's broken out there in terms of how it's delivered to clients. So we would like to continue to kind of be that holistic solution and create like wonderful, beautiful client experiences that both the end client and the advisor can use to make things more efficient and drive down the overall cost and transparency to the end user. Can you speak to what that other product is? Are we talking the insurance world or I mean, listen, insurance, mortgages, yeah. loan products. I mean, all of that stuff, I think, can be done, you know, a lot more uh, succinctly and, and easily. You know, you're starting to see various companies, even the big kind of insurance companies offer term insurance digitally. You know, I think you could kind of push that even farther. So we'd like to obviously continue to, to expand what we offer. That's, an, that's a challenge because, I mean, those markets historically are not big on transparency. As yeah. much as we can beat up on the investment industry on it, I mean, the insurance world, the transparency is, you know, the equivalent of four curtains deep. Yeah. <laughs> so it's not going to happen. No. So, uh, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, no, you know, it, it's certainly not an easy challenge, yeah. but, you know, the changes in the investment management industry, how fast they've happened over the last kind of four or five years, there's still a lot more to come in terms of transparency and CRM three and four and five that, you know, at some point will probably come out. You know, the insurance industry also is is ripe for change. And I think you're seeing certainly companies looking to disrupt that, empower it enable it and you know i think at the end of the day it's only good for clients so and this is why i commend your your primary investors so much with power is because you know they own investors group and they yeah. own great west yeah and you know what they're they're literally backing companies that are disrupting their own core financial streams right now so in general then speaking we're kind of sum up your value proposition in, as quickly as possible what it is you do for let's talk about your value proposition to clients first and then yeah. to advisors second Sure. To the end client, it's it's basically democratizing investing, letting anyone invest in a low cost, transparent, disciplined approach to investing. And if that's what people are looking for, then you know we might be a solution for mm -hmm. them. On the advisor side, all of that still applies, but I think the real value comes in in automating and systematizing the operational workflow that they do day in and day out. Mm -hmm. That is a painful experience. You said it twice. You could keep saying painful over and over again. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, hashtag painful. Hashtag painful. <laughs> um, it's gonna. It's trending in our industry. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, you know, allowing advisors to do more productive things with their time. Fantastic. Well, thank you so much for making the time. We very much appreciate it. And I hope everyone enjoys this as much as I did. Thanks for having me in. Thanks. I hope you enjoyed that interview with Dave Nugent of Well Simple. I've known him for a little while now, and he's a great guy, and his company's doing some remarkable things. Join us next week for the next episode of the FinTech Impact Podcast. I'm your host, Jason Pereira. This podcast was brought to you by Woodgate Financial, an award-winning financial planning firm catering to high net worth individuals and their families. To learn more, go to woodgate.com. You can subscribe to this podcast on iTunes, Stitcher, and Google Play, or find more episodes at fintechimpact.co.